Hey, what's up, guys? Usually I try to stay away from talking about the same uh, subject twice in a row, but um, I was really curious after uh, yesterday's video talking about the uh, 1949 Cubs and their kind of odd transactions. I thought, geez, I mean, if this team really in real life is down to whatever it is, like 17, 18 players, there's got to be something in the newspaper about it, right? Well, and as you can imagine, as you probably already guessed, um, yeah, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Let me change over here to the screen view. I knew this was going to happen, so uh, bear with me for a second as I uh, get my face uh, set up uh, correctly here, and we'll make myself a little bit smaller here on the side. There you go. Um, apologies for uh, having to uh, have you sit through that. This uh, There was some sort of update to OBS or something that screwed um, over every th single thing that I had saved. Uh, what you can see here is this is the Chicago Daily Tribune from uh, May twentieth, 1949, which is the uh, time that we're looking at. Um, and, of course, what happened here is uh, their opening game with the Phillies in real life was rained out, right? So, uh, you know, the Cubs front office was more than willing to uh, have believed the weatherman's morning threat of a dreary afternoon postponed yesterday's scheduled opener. Um, it turned uh, it proved wise for it turned out no fit day for the homecoming of four 1948 Cubs now with Philadelphia. Nicholson... Um, and uh, on and on, uh, Hank Bowery, Eddie Widekus, um, and Russ Meyer. The way that this is written is not very easy to uh, figure out. I think that Bowery pitched the game um, for me as well. Um, anyway, uh, as I look through this, I note that uh, Herman Reich, who actually started the game for the Cubs, I believe I had him starting, maybe I had him coming in off the bench, I can't remember which one it was, Yesterday, um, he uh, was due to report at Wrigley Field that afternoon and technically could have started right away, although I, my guess is that they probably wouldn't have started him right after getting off the train. There's nothing in here that I was able to find about, you know, uh, how, um, you know, crazy things were for the Cubs or the fact that, you know, there were not, you know, many... Uh, players on the uh, team at all or anything like that. I mean, there's no real surprise here, right? I mean, you look at this, they are a last place team in real life, just as I think that they are in the replay. I can't remember if they or Cincinnati are at the bottom, but one of the two um, is at the bottom. Um, whereas the uh, White Sox were somewhat competitive. And so as a result, of course, you can see that the White Sox end up with the big headline and the Cubs kind of um, are hidden down there. We can take a look at one other place and sort of see if we can come up with any sort of answer um, just for fun and uh, just because we're here. Um, so usually we can find this stuff. I, uh, the way that I do this, if you um, are trying to uh, replicate this um, on your own, is I usually try to take a quick glance here and uh, try to get a feel for where each section probably starts and probably ends. Usually I'm going to be off by a little bit, right? So, yeah, I've gone too far over the one way. It's always hard to tell with all the advertisements and stuff, although they're pretty cool to look through. Um, and then you just sort of put your uh, put your stake down somewhere and uh, take a uh, look and see if you can find it or not. And if you can't find it, then you go back again and you go take a look and see if you can't find it the second time. So we're going definitely into the wrong section. Um, so we go back and we uh, take a quick look and see if there isn't uh, something else that we can find to uh, direct us to the sports section. Um, it's probably going to be after the uh, Today with Women section. Um, and so we'll uh, move forward really quickly. Of course, given my luck, it'll end up being in the section that we just skipped, and maybe that's uh, what's going on. Um, and so uh, we'll give another try. How about that? Um, and, uh, well, that's where we were. And here we go. That's all where we were. That's interesting. I wonder, maybe there's maybe there's something missing or something going on. I do notice that we also have the um, other um, edition section. Ah, here we go. So they had it way back here at the back. Yeah, look at that part four. Um, and what we're looking for here, again, is um, whether or not the Chicago fights, although that would be somewhat interesting, what we're really looking for here is to see if there's any sort of news about um, transactions. Good heavens, I mean... <laughs> The, uh, the Dodgers um, scored five in the first, ended up uh, winning 14-5 to five over the Cubs. That was uh, not uh, the game that I played today, but the uh, game that I played yesterday. That's one of the reasons why in my uh, Diamond Mind replay the uh, Dodgers are playing so well all of a sudden. It's because they get to play the Cubs now. Um, so we look through this really quick, and we see, I mean, is there anything here about Chicago Cubs transactions that we can see? Um, and I'm not seeing uh, very much... Not much is uh, uh, 
is really uh, standing out to me. It's not really unusual that not much would stand out, though, as I was just saying, because uh, the Cubs um, were not exactly a, a contending team. And when you have a team that's not really a contender, it's not really that much of a surprise that uh, nobody's writing anything about them because who cares? All right, so there's really not too much going on here in terms of uh, transactions being reported in the paper. Nobody really, I guess, is going out into the clubhouse and counting the number of men. It's always possible that the Cubs uh, may have had more men on the uh, Major League roster, but they just didn't want to start some of them. Right. It's it's difficult to say. And really, I mean, I know I talked uh, with you about this um, a little bit before, but that's kind of the difficulty of uh, real life transactions. That's one of those things that, you know, when we when we create sort of like the game structure and we're thinking, okay, yeah, we're going to make it so that we use like this sort of setup or that sort of thing. And we're going to try to make this as realistic as we possibly can. What we often forget is that um, there may be players on the roster that are not reflected in the official transactions that we have, sometimes because they never actually played a game, right? Or because it just didn't appear at that time or something may be going off. It may be that some of the sources are not entirely on. You know, there's all sorts of different things that can go on when it comes to uh, dealing with these transactions. I know that because I've seen it, I, I know that there are uh, people People who um, uh, put a lot of stock in, um, you know, lists that will tell you like what the roster size limits were for certain years. I haven't really gotten to this yet, but um, especially for the really early years of baseball, I'm talking like before the American League and National League had their piece. Um, there was no actual, uh, so the roster size limits existed, but um, there there was no attempt to actually enforce those limits, right? So if you read something, I don't remember off the top of my head what the limit is, but if it says that like the American League only allowed like 15 players a team in 1901 or something like that, that limit actually didn't exist in reality. That was the idea. That's what Ben Johnson wanted to do. He had no way of enforcing it, right? And it was common practice at the time for teams to pick up players on a trial basis. I mentioned this before. If you've played football manager, you know what this is about. They would give them a trial contract, and they could use that contract as a major league contract, which is what it was, and allow those players to uh, play in major league baseball games. Right? There are many examples of that. If you read the uh, Norman Mock books about Connie Mack, you will see tons and tons of examples of that because he did that throughout his entire career. If you start going through game by game and team by team, you'll see this, and you'll run into guys who played one game and um, in some cases did like okay and then disappeared off the face of the earth and you're like what happened to these guys right if you go deep again this is the sort of thing where your average sabermetrican your average like statistician tends to like just totally gloss over this stuff they don't really care much about it if you are like me and you take a real close look at seasons like 1919 you'll notice that the Philadelphia Athletics used you know I can't remember what it was like 45 players or something crazy like that a good percentage of those players were trialists right Connie Mack knew that he needed better pitch Pitching, and he knew that there were some uh, holes in his lineup in the positions. He needed to get players on board to be able to like test them out, and he figured the best way to test them out was to throw them into a major league game. In some cases, we were literally talking about sandlot kids. And you would say, well, it's an awful idea that would never work, but the Philadelphia Athletics of the late 20s were, ba were built based around this theory and this philosophy. I mean, it actually did work, which is the thing that's crazy, because if you go after 100 different kids, you might get one that actually has that talent. You know, that's the idea behind it. Um, anyway, kind of a long rant and long spiel about this, but you know, if you're trying to enforce roster limits, if you're saying I'm not going to use transactions and I'm going to try to use the framework that exists in real life, you won't necessarily be successful in doing so because sometimes the rules weren't really enforced and weren't really applied, right? Or sometimes in this case, like with the Cubs, if you use real life transactions and you say this is realistic, but you're using the as schedule schedule, not the as played schedule, it becomes difficult, right? Maybe some of the players who had the day off or whatever actually didn't. They actually would have been in the game had it been played that day, but the game was rained out. So it doesn't matter that they weren't on the team, right? So what do you do? How do you deal with it? I don't know. The way I deal with it is I just go play, right? Whatever. 
that's what happened, and then we go to the next game. But just so you know, I mean, the, this is one of those things about replays, right? The, no matter how good your intention is, no matter how much time you spend on it, and no matter how much research you do, there will always be something that you'll discover where you're like, well, what am I supposed to do in this situation, right? Whether it's, you know, Billy Martin starting the same pitcher two games in a row in 1980 that totally screws everything up if you're using real-life trans- real lineups, right? Because, I mean... What happens if he pitched really well the first time, right? You know, that, that really gives you a difficult situation, you know. Or if it's, you know, a team playing really well who then that then uh, trades off its star players, right? I mean, you know, if that sort of thing happens, like, it's really, really hard to come up with a good and realistic um, answer to the problem. Now, we haven't been playing OTP yet. I have played OTP before, and I know that many of you probably have as well. Um, the fact that OTP does have a computer manager that will make trades does not necessarily mean that it is realistic, but sometimes the trades you're able to pull off might actually have happened in real life. We could talk a lot and talk for a long time about the art of trading in OTP and what is and what is not realistic and um, different ways in which the game, at least theoretically, could be modified to better um reflect real realistic trading and uh, things that better um, model what actual uh, managers and general managers would do. It's a real, real difficult subject, right? And I mean, even in real life baseball, right? Trading, free agent signings and stuff, it's complicated, right? As a fan, you can look at this and say, oh, well, they obviously need to do this or they need to do that. And the next thing you know, the Yankees signed, what, like 35-year-old Joss Donaldson, pay him like $28 million a year, and he um, like doesn't just decline, he goes off a cliff, right? So, I mean, it can be hard to say. You might look at this and say it's a sure thing or he'd be a great fit for the organization, and then next thing you know, you're playing $28 million for a guy who's hitting, you know, whatever he's hitting, like 150 or something like that, who has absolutely no hope. You know, so um, it's hard to say. It's hard to say. But uh, there you have it. Love to know, as, as usual, what your thoughts are on transactions and um, especially on dealing with these kind of issues that um, pop up every now and then. It can be a little bit thorny. And uh, with that, I will uh, let you uh, go about your business and we'll talk with you again tomorrow. Bye-bye.